welcome to Rant Your Heart Out Georgetown with me, Kate. The podcast for, well, ranting your heart out. (laughs) I am, said Kate from the title, and today my topic is guilty pleasures, but in a weird way. So I want to start out with just getting a little more into the why of why I've made this podcast, and I want to start with just how people don't, or no, I don't want to generalize, but I feel like I have noticed a trend in the world of negative ranting. You know, this sucks, here's why, I hate this, and that's super valid. You need to get that out too, but I know when I do that, I feel just kind of like disgusting inside, like so negative. I want to create a space where you can rant about things you love, things you've noticed that are nice, things you like, things that are okay. (laughs) Meh. But yeah, see, in episode one, uh, Yurnals Can Be Art 2, I talked about art because I love art and I love art history. I got into some negative things because you kind of have to to get the full picture. Not that this is in any way a full picture of anything. I'm incredibly biased about everything. (laughs) But I felt really nice after recording. Like, light, I reminded myself about things I really enjoy and about passions. Like, I cackled to myself the entire time I was editing that episode. And, like, I know I could definitely use more things to just like these days and specifically like nerdy shit dumb shit you know this is a no shame zone unless you're an asshole this is a sometimes shame zone that was a lovely mini rant about my own podcast this is self-love this this is (laughs) self-care after episode one i really was not sure what to rant about But then I got started thinking about guilty pleasures and how much I hate that term. Like, you should not feel guilty about something that brings you joy. Unless it's illegal. Murder would be an actual guilty pleasure. We're gonna move on. But I'm talking about, like, eating a ton of chocolate, watching that dumbass tv show listening to this corny album for the 10th time in a row i'm talking about loving things that other people look down on for xyz for whatever reason no reason honestly pretentious people are not allowed near me (laughs) this is how um this is how i'm going into 2021 pretentious people assholes no thank you No, I don't want that negativity. I don't want to be judged for listening to horrible music or watching horrible movies or reading horrible books. Trust me, I know they're bad, and that's part of why I love them. It's one thing if you don't want to do those things. Fuck yeah, don't do them if you don't want to. But I want to do them. So let people find their joy and let them revel in that joy. Even if they think, A piece of trash media is the height of art, okay? I love me a good urinal. That sounded so bad. Please listen to episode one. (laughs) But anyway, my likes, my likes do not impact you. And people can like a ton of things at the same time. People contain multitudes. Walt Whitman was correct. You know what? Okay, okay. Uh, Here is that section. Not the whole poem. (laughs) In full. Section 51 of Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. The past and present wilt. I have filled them, emptied them, and processed to fill my next fold of the future. Listener up there, what have you to confide to me? Look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly. No one else hears you and I stay only a minute longer. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I concentrate toward them that are nigh. I wait on the door slab. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through with his supper? 
Who wishes to walk with me? Will you speak before I'm gone? Will you prove already too late? And, you know, that's the crux of it. We all contain multitudes. Like, you can love classics. I'm a big Jane Austen fan, and I'm also a huge garbage journal fan. Please listen to the fr- Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> they're all pleasures. They're all joys, and they're all harmless. Like, these are harmless. So, another quote-unquote guilty pleasure of mine is actually fan fiction. It's a huge guilty pleasure of mine that I don't want to feel guilty about. I just feel like I will be judged if I'm being seen reading fan fiction. That it's, like, childish. Which, there are people in their 30s who write fan fiction. If writing isn't your profession, but you love to do it as a hobby, fan fiction is perfect. Character traits, circumstances, some plotline, it's already all there for you. You just have to fill in dialogue you have to fill in actions like fill in what you want to happen and you can change whatever you want as well or listen you could also do fully original stuff there's there's no rules and the thing is for readers this isn't starting a new book this isn't a full commitment to learning a new world learning an author's new style even learning all these new characters and also listen books are long But, like, in fanfiction, I can read a quick, like, 2,000-word fanfiction when I go to sleep. And, boom, I'm having sweet dreams with my favorite book characters in my head. You know? It's just lovely. It's not a real commitment. It has a small beginning, middle end, and then you're done. Just like that. And there are extremely long fanfictions. If you do want to make that commitment in that, like... To make a reading commitment, but not a new world commitment, which good for you. It's so satisfying. Fan fiction is also so good for developing writers. Like the only reason I'm good at reading comprehension, thank you, SATs, is because of fan fiction and real books. But I learned how to write competently because I wrote a whole ton of trash fan fiction when I was in middle school. And I could read on all these different sites. I could read what I liked and I could find out what it was that I liked. The description, the flow of words, the the, the style. Like I could find what is working here and I could find what I do not like. You know, it's stilted, it's stiff, all those things. It's just, it's lovely. It's lovely. Alrighty, that was my rant. And now we are going to be moving on to a sort of rant conversation. I love Taylor Swift's discography. But like, I'm not a Swifty. You know what I mean? And that is my roommate, Andrew Molinari. You can stream his new song, Lines, on Spotify right now under the name Andrew Robert. Why, why is that guilty? I feel kind of guilty about it. I don't know exactly why. I think it's something with Taylor Swift in specific. Internalized like, misogyny. Get the fuck out of I here. I mean, I'm right. I love Lady Gaga's music. I love Charlie XCX. I love a bunch of these, like, Carly Rae Jepsen, mm-hmm. bubblegum pop, like, queens and princesses. Mm-hmm. And I follow their personal lives. I follow like what projects Lady Gaga is working on. I follow what Carly Rae Jepsen is doing on the side. Um, But I feel like with Taylor Swift in specific, because like her personal life has become a massive part of her image and her career. I feel like if people saw me on Spotify listening to Taylor Swift, they'd be like, oh, he's a Swifty, but I'm not a Swifty. 
What is it about the word Swifty that you won't put on yourself? Because I think that's part of it. Like, from my view at least, uh, a Swifty is another thing you should feel guilty about because, like, Swifty means you really like Taylor Swift, and Taylor Swift is just like this girl who, like, Kanye dissed and who, like, dates a ton of men and blah, blah, blah. And it has, like, that kind of, like, you're a 14-year-old girl in her bedroom, even though Taylor Swift's fans have, like, grown with her. Like, we're now 20 when, like, she released her first album. Like, we were 10. Like, yeah. that kind of a thing. So, like, th- that's, that's like, my hypothesis with the Swifty term. I've been thinking about it because of the Fearless re-release, which is golden. <laughs> It does make sense. It does make sense. And there definitely is like a little bit of internalized misogyny with the concept of a Swifty in general, mm-hmm. right? I just like never really identified, I guess, with like the same things that my girlfriends were exploring. And Taylor Swift generally has been binarily like, female. Like binarily female. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's why growing up I never identified as a Swifty. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, yes. right? Swifty, I think, has become, like, somewhat of an embarrassing term. It's the same thing as my girlfriends who are, like, One Direction fans. It's the same thing as yeah. me when I look back on the art pop era in mm-hmm. high school. And yeah. who wants to, like, constantly be reminded of their teenage years? This might just be me because, like, in thinking about guilty pleasures, I'm like, I should stop being embarrassed, just period. Mm-hmm. Like, I should never be embarrassed, which that's fa- false. That's false. I should be, but it's fine. <laughs> We're moving on. And I was Snapchatting with this one guy, and um, he was like, oh, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm with my roommates. We're doing a fearless, re- like, a uh, re-release party, mm-hmm. like, listening party. And he was like, oh, I went to peg you as a Swifty. And I right. took that, I, like... I took that as a specific insult on my character. Exactly. I was like, of course I'm a Swifty. <laughs> I like messaged him back. I was like, what do you mean by that? And he was like, I like, I don't know. I don't know. I just didn't think you li-. And I was like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> because like definitely when when people who are not Swifties use it, it's a hundred percent derogatory. It's always like, but I thought you were like a cool girl and cool girls yes. don't listen to Taylor yes. Swift. Cool girls are like, Taylor Swift is too feminine for me because I'm a bruh girl. <laughs> it feels to me like being a Swifty, mm-hmm. it, it like the image is the 15 year old girl from our age yeah. in high school, and middle school, who was like listening to red and like buying a Polaroid camera because of the 1989 album cover. Like the image is there, but that's also just, it's not true anymore. Yeah. You know, Lady Gaga fans, we don't call ourselves little monsters anymore. Yeah. Like, like the mo- the mother yeah. monster image is totally gone. And it like, I, maybe it's a thing of, about semantics too. Maybe semantics plays a role into it also because Swifties were the same thing. Everyone was calling themselves, you know, um, back in 2014. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. She has some amazing songs. Yeah. I think she's such a gifted songwriter and like someone who can make just ordinary life sound so magical. Yes. Um, I like, I really, I listen to her work and, and it has inspired a lot of like, how I've been learning to songwrite over the past year. Yeah. I feel like if if one of my random friends at college like picked up my phone off the table and saw that like um I don't know, saw that like new romantics was playing in my earbuds, right? Like they I don't think they would understand that like I'm listening to it because I think the production technology is mm-hmm. so cool in it. I think it was really ahead of its time or like should have been a single because it like really spoke to that era of pop. Um, like they wouldn't see the song, they'd see the they'd artist. See, they'd see like Taylor Swift's Swifties, like like Mecca fan base, mm-hmm. like craziness. It's tough for artists like Taylor who like rose to start mega stardom mm-hmm. um, toward like kind of the finality of I don't know, like objectification and a lot of the, you know, a, a lot of the, the tabloid culture. It was like t- 2008, yes. which was a bad time which was for not everyone. a good time, exactly. Low rise jeans. Exactly. <laughs> well, Britney Spears, that was the- That was the Britney. It was the beginning of the end in, in 2008. Mm-hmm. But when you rise to stardom and the tabloids are grasping for their dear life, yeah. like 
they were going after her and built a lot of the misogynistic symbolism and a lot of the, not symbolism, but a lot of the messaging, that's mm-hmm. what I meant to say, um, around her career. And how do you shape, like, you yeah. know, she did an entire folk album, two entire indie folk albums and still can barely shake it. And I feel like people have kind of laughed at her when she's tried to take control of her own narrative again. Yeah. I think it's with Taylor Swift in specific. Um, it is centralized on Taylor Swift, but it also just like makes me think of how many female artists did we not get like because of this, yeah. you know? Especially because it's very much based in a, like 2008 more so, but it's very much based in a like, one woman at a time can succeed. No more, <laughs> one at a time. I don't know about that. I don't think it's that the pop industry was not like, a a lucrative space for women for me it's more so like i can name several boys who were famous at the same time whereas and like famous and liked by the media at the same time Mm. whereas for women artists it was really like oh kesha's so cool no she's not anymore oh taylor swift is one no she's a bitch like blah blah like it's very yeah. yeah like with women it's like you have one shot for like a two week period to be well liked and from then on it's like it's not your turn anymore whereas like men can be well liked harry styles has never not been liked yeah like and he's amazing he deserves it but like that's not saying the women don't also i will say with the absolute dominance of social media and the absolute disappearance of tabloid magazines um you know i i think it's become a lot easier for female artists to stay in a stable environment. And with social media, though, there is that bad side. Like, Taylor Swift had to delete her, in, like, every single Instagram post because they were yeah. all getting spammed with that snake emoji. And, like, she reclaimed it, and it was beautiful and, like, amazing. But it's because, like, an artist pointed at her and said, she's mean to me. And it's like, is she? <laughs> So, I don't know. There is still work to be done, Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the music industry has never been a a rapidly changing industry, except for the music itself. And Taylor Swift's music itself is really good. Well, thank you, Andrew, for that rant. Um, I think that's going to do it for us today. Folks, I would like to leave you with a poem. Here is The Heart of a Woman by Georgia Douglas Johnson. The heart of a woman goes forth with the dawn as a lone bird soft winging so restlessly on. Afar o'er life's turrets and vales does it roam. In the wake of those echoes the heart calls home. The heart of a woman falls back with the night and enters some alien cage in its plight and tries to forget it has dreamed of the stars while it breaks, breaks, breaks on the sheltering bars. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, And thank you, Andrew, for your lovely contribution. It was a great talk, honestly. And of course, uh, thank you, Taylor Swift. Love of my life. You've done everything for me. I'm gonna tear up. No, I'm not. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll see you later, Georgetown. Until then, keep ranting your heart out. <laughs>